1979, uh, my family and I escaped from Iran when the Ayatollah Khomeini and his uh, zealots um, had a revolution and overthrew the government of Iran. My dad at that time was in the military and um, we knew that our lives were in danger. And so we escaped from Iran and eventually ended up here in America as refugees. Um, when I got here, I was, uh, we moved to Texas, but not just Texas, Travis. We moved to um, Colleen, Texas, where the where Fort Hood, the largest army base in the world is. And so imagine during the Iranian hostage situation where every day people are waking up and they're watching Iran burn the American flag, called America the great Satan, and they'd held 54 Americans hostage in the American embassy every day. And so it was front page news every day. I mean, Dan Rather would start the news every day with, Day 62 of the hostage situation, day 64. It was all everybody was, it was like, how do we get our Americans back home? During the middle of all of that, we parachute in basically into Texas, small military town in America. And so talk about fish out of water. Faith, influence, and business. That's the heart of what we'll talk about in the leadership room brought to you by Cardia Media. We will discuss how these big topics intersect how they've changed the people and communities they touch, and the stories behind the leaders who flourish here. From drugs to homelessness to trauma and foster care kids, to redemption, success, and everything in between. These stories should be told. Thanks for listening. If you want to follow along with Cardia Media as we build the company, go to cardiamedia.beehive.com. That's K-A-R-D-I-A-M-E-D-I-A dot B-E-E-H-I-I-V dot com and sign up for our newsletter. Can you imagine moving to Texas as an Iranian immigrant in 1979 during the Iranian hostage crisis? That's what my next guest did with his family. David Nasser is an incredible man. He is the president of Four Others, which is a nonprofit in Tennessee that fights for vulnerable kids around the country. He, a couple years ago, started with Four Others, but before that, he was the vice president at Liberty University, which is a University on the East Coast. He um, invested in college students. He interacted with celebrities, interviewing constantly some of the most important leaders in our in our country. He has an incredible story of his own growth personally, spiritually, in faith and business, and as a leader. And I really look forward to you having the opportunity to hear this story and what he has to say in this podcast. So enjoy. Glad to have David Nasser with me today. Uh, really incredible person. I've spent hours watching videos and reading and um, looking into the books you've written and some of the content you've created over decades of this faithful leadership that you've you've created over over years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, just thrilled to have you today. Thanks for joining me. This is gonna be awesome. Travis, thanks so much uh, for having me. Uh, what an honor to be with uh, you know yeah. with you today. And, we it's it's so cool it's great to see somebody in in the flesh that you've kind of watched on video that you've seen from afar at at events and somebody that's that's been so meaningful and this podcast is really trying to dive into the intersection of faith leadership and business how do those those things you know connect together but first before anything i saw this video of you i think it was right before the pandemic playing tennis with john McEnroe, and you you want a point <laughs> And I got to get you to give me a little perspective on that because that that's got to be like top five situation. I mean, you've had quite a life. Your story is amazing. So I'm being obviously totally crazy, but yeah. you want to point against John McEnroe is pretty cool. Well, I, I, let's just go ahead and call it for what it is. I mean, he was uh, he he totally let me win. I think because he knew I had his honorarium check in the, my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a wise man. But uh, we brought uh, we brought uh, John McEnroe, uh, Andy Roddick, uh, Blake, and uh, Chan. Uh, at my old job, I, I hosted uh, at Liberty University Convocation, and so we brought those four tennis legends in uh, for a convocation. And a fun part of it was um, we talked life and tennis and leadership and all these fun things in the Q and A format. And then um, we walked down and we had a tennis court and we played, you know, points together. And uh, 
you know, <laughs> obviously he let me win that point, but it was so fun. I don't know, man. Highlight, it was a, one of the highlights of my life. You know, you know, he, he hit a drop shot and then you, you had a nice little, you know, cross court. I, I don't think you could have gotten to it. I, I just don't, but you know, <laughs> that's a, that's a whole different animal. I, I just had to bring that up because I thought it was, it was fun. There's, you know, the other YouTube videos that I thought that, yeah. I, that I hope we can get to that I thought were funny, but um, you know, that, that kind of takes Man, from Travis, the, are you a tennis, are you a tennis fan? I, I love tennis. I played when I was a kid. I don't play very much anymore, but yeah, I need to get my girls into it. So, I, you know, I, tennis is like my sport. That's the sport I played a lot growing up. And, uh, and honestly, man, uh, the, the craziest part of the day was later that afternoon, uh, telling Andy Roddick, just do a regular serve, like what you normally do, not the charity serve, not that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put my weight into it, but just like, give me a regular serve, you know, and it, it's not even the same game. You know what I mean? Like, it came yeah. so fast. It's so deadly. You know, I just realized like, uh, yeah, I've never really played tennis. All I've done, you know, <laughs> all I've done you... is pretended like I'm playing tennis compared to this game. But it was such a fun thing. Uh, when I was at Liberty, you know, we did um, um, twice a week. And when I first got there, actually three times a week, we did convocation. And so when you do um, a lot of convos a week, gathering 10,000 plus students, um, you want to make it as exciting and as fun as possible and as compelling and encouraging as possible. And so, man, we would have Steph Curry. We would have, you know, the John McInnes of the world, the Jordan Petersons of the world. Yeah. Uh, we'd have Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. You know what I mean? Like our, our environment was big enough to learn from people we didn't agree with. Um, I'd have Cornell West come with Dr. George. And Dr. George, you can't get more conservative than Robert George, you know, from Princeton. And you can't get more liberal than Cornell West from Harvard. But these guys sat there and talked about how to how to disagree well, how to learn from one another. And so for me, a big part of that was um, building the I, I call it the spiritual immune system of our students and to learn to see people in their humanity and to honor people that maybe sometimes don't even honor them. And so, you know, a day like that, it was sure fun to play some tennis points with John McEnroe. But honestly, like learning from a guy who is a leader and learning from a guy who's learned how to persevere and learning from a guy who's really found a second chapter of influence in his life to give himself away. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's that's what the context behind that video. But sure, we had a lot of fun. I loved it. It was fun to watch. And, you know, a lot of convocations. You, you mentioned Jordan Peterson. And, you know, I'm going to just jump into that really quick because it feels like a, a decent yeah. flow just to, to talk about that because, you know, you guys talk about purpose and you're in front of all these kids and they're fighting through a crazy environment nowadays where where they're told a lot of lies and we're all kind of mm. all of us are fighting for purpose, right? In some form or fashion. So a lot, most of us find it in, in bad things and we find, you know, that it's not the right stuff. But you had Jordan Peterson and you were on stage yeah. and somebody jumped up on stage and kind of, you know, this, this kid struggling through whatever he was struggling through with some mental health crisis. And it's just, it was kind yeah. of a microcosm of our society now where you're seeing your just kids are struggling through lack of purpose and struggle and truth. And, um, you know, I, I think your response to that and then your follow-up conversation you had with him that I also watched on YouTube was mm -hmm. really excellent as far as talking about purpose and the, his 12 rules for life. Can you tell, just say really quick, like how important that is just as a base yeah. level for you purpose. I know you've lived your life deeply in, in purpose. Um, but that conversation was amazing to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Travis, uh, you know, uh, when Dr. Peterson came to be our guest, uh, at, uh, at convocation, um, at that time he had the second hottest book in the world. You know, he was 11 million copies in sales. Michelle Obama was number one with her book and Dr. Peterson was number two. And, um, and at that moment, you know, at that cultural moment, Jordan Peterson earlier that week had uh, basically been shut down at Harvard, you know, at, at a symposium where he was supposed to speak and people were throwing bricks through the windows and silencing him. And, and for us, our tent was big enough to learn from people that maybe we didn't agree with. And certainly with Dr. Peterson, it was such an opportunity to, to dis put on display 
uh, what Christian young adults look like who don't see a message that um, they might not see completely eye to eye with in every way as something to cause hostility, but instead an opportunity to show hospitality. And so I had told our students, Dr. Peterson's coming. He's searching for God, but he's certainly not a believer. But he has these rules for life. And many of you have read his books. Many of you have listened to his podcast. At that time, Travis, he was packing out, you know, um, just the big rooms in the house. I mean, he was going to Carnegie Hall and it was packed with 95 percent young men standing in line five hours, six hours to get in to see him. And he'd really touched the cord. And so we um, we had Dr. Peterson come and we were about 10 minutes into the conversation with him when a young man who was not a college student from our university, just he was there visiting that day, um, who had read Dr. Peterson's book and Dr. Peterson's book had really impacted him, came down and jumped on stage. And I saw him from my peripheral, like I'm listening to Dr. Peterson. I just pitched him a softball, pitched him a question. He's answering. I looked to my left and I see he had pink hair. The young man had pink hair, so it was impossible to miss. And when he jumped on stage, I thought maybe because I had some context of him being protested the week before, you know, I thought it was just somebody maybe jumping on stage or something. And and he had something behind him, Travis. So when he jumped on stage, he kind of had something in his hand behind him. So I thought, is it a gun? Is it paint? You know, is he going to spray paint on? Like, what is it? You know, is it a cup of something that he wants to like throw on our guest? So I just went into protect dad mode. You know, <laughs> so I saw. Yeah, I just if you watch over. the video, you can yeah. see like you hop up and you kind of go and you get in between him and uh, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, and honestly, it's all happening in real time. I, I, I don't have a. I, I don't. I, I'm trying to process what's happening. So I'm just trying to get between him and the guest, you know, so that I can protect the guest. And um, and he he jumps on stage. I start walking towards him and he said really loud, I need help. I need help. And my natural just flow right out of that was, well, you've come to the right place, hmm. you know, and that's such a God moment. Because <laughs> as soon as I said that, I think it made him feel like, oh, this isn't hostile. Like, you know, and what it turned out to be is uh, there was a young man who was there, who obviously needed help. And his his method of crying out for help <laughs> certainly warranted, you know, uh, you know, uh, correction. Like, that's not the way you get out, buddy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, there's better ways to ask for help. However, I appreciated his honesty. And so I started praying for him. And Dr. Peterson came over and said, I hope you get the help that you need. And then I looked over as I was praying and Dr. Peterson was crying. And it was just a moment, you know. Uh, off script to see, I think the posture and the hero that day was our students. I mean, so gracious, so all just ready to like 10,000 of them just going after God to pray for this young man. And, and, um, and it was a real opportunity then. So then we go back on stage, you know, we kind of take a few minutes to get all that settled. And we know we're you're throwing out the script then, like all the questions you had, <laughs> You were going to talk about C.S. Lewis and all these different, like that's all, that's all thrown out the door. So I said, Hey, Dr. Peterson, you know, this young man has read your books, you know, and I know you're writing more rules for your next book, but I, I just believe the best thing I have to offer him aren't more rules. I love your rules, but he needs the ruler, you know, he needs the savior. And it, it just gave us a window to be able to have a real honest conversation with him uh, in real time in front of 10,000 students who were just kind of reeling from the shock of what just happened, you know. And it's funny, Travis, when I look back on the seven years that I was there, the greatest moments we had were always like that. They were off script, unplanned, and all of them always were not me being the hero with a microphone in my hand, but a student doing something extraordinary, you know? Uh, for example, when we had um, Steph Curry, the entire reason Steph Curry came, I had invited him multiple times. He was not interested in coming at that moment. He was so, you know, so, bit, so busy. Steph's an incredible leader. But the reason he said yes wasn't Liberty, wasn't me, wasn't, you know, um, there was a young man who was a student there who had this audacious idea. And on his own, Travis, he had um, 
collected 10,000 pairs of shoes for people who were refugees in the Congo because he used to be a Congolese refugee and he watched children in those refugee camps get jiggers that went through their toes. Mm. And so on his own, a 20 year old student didn't know any better than to travel around the country and put in his car pairs of shoes that he had collected. So imagine 10,000 pairs of shoes he'd collected. So he comes to me and I went to Steph Curry's team and I said, this guy's collected 10,000 pairs of shoes. What if our students doubled his shoe collection in one day? Everybody brought a pair of shoes and we were a Nike uh, school, like our football oh, no. team, our basketball Don't team. Don't bring up were Nike, Nike with Steph Curry, right? And, <laughs> well, here's what was beautiful. He's, you know, he's on, under armor. Yeah, yeah. And so Under Armour came and we only had like adult size shoes, right? Because that's what these college students brought and that's what he collected. Sure. So Under Armour brought, Under Armour and Nike partnered together in that moment and they brought a bunch of children's shoes and we collected over 25,000 pairs of shoes all together. Wow. But the hero of that day wasn't even Steph Curry, you know? It certainly wasn't me. Like the hero that day and that Q&A and everything was 10,000 students brought came alongside another student who was a Congolese refugee and together they raised 25,000 pairs of shoes for refugees in Africa. That's you know incredible. what I mean? That's so incredible. That, I think it's such a, I think it's such a moment of just reminding like, I, when I look back at those seven years, the students were always the heroes. Yeah. You know, Donald Miller was one of our guests one time and he gave me pretty early on when I got there and he gave me a really great a piece of advice. He said, you know, your job is to kind of be the kiosk in the mall as the leader. Like you're just pointing other people to the greatness, you know, like your job is not to be the hero, but to make them the hero. And man, our students were the heroes, you know, yeah. like that day with Jordan Peterson, our students were the heroes, the way oh. they treated that young man, the way they treated Dr. Peterson, the, the kind of Dr. Peterson had his mom there, the way she was around our students. Honestly, so many of our uh, guests that came didn't share our faith, and they were always blown away by the gracious hospitality and the kindness. I call it the fruit of the spirit, right? Patience, self-control, good, you know, like there was just something about them. And that's kind of what we led with for so many times, you know? That's Um, incredible. So, yeah, I I know I got into the Steph Curry story, but I I just want to tell you, like when people ask me, what was your favorite combos that we did? It was never those celebrities that we had. I mean, we had a lot of celebrities. Yeah, my favorite did. combo was when uh, – my favorite, favorite combo in seven years at Liberty in my old job, Travis, was the Special Olympics combo where our students made heroes of – I mean, of these, these Special Olympic athletes that came. And in real time, you know, we had half the room all in blue, half the room all in red just going all out for these kids <laughs> cheering for them and they were doing stuff and we had the basketball you know what i'm saying like they made much of god's special children you know that day i i left that day punch drunk like with it doesn't get any better than this you yeah. know and it's uh so and so yeah uh it was crazy to see see that old job but college yeah. students are amazing I, I went to college ministry with campus outreach and and at Furman university in south carolina out of college and I spent two years yeah. there and, and I grew a ton through campus outreach. And so I, I gave him a couple years of my life and college students are such a sweet spot in life. You know, they're, they're kind of starting to own their own convictions. They're starting to figure out what their dreams are, where they're going, where they're headed. They're, they're starting to think on their own because they don't have their parents or influencers around them. You know, they're, they're so ripe for thinking through leadership principles, faith principles, these things that are, such a huge deal to, um, to who we are as, as individuals. And so the college, the college, college students are amazing. It's a really great space to invest. Yeah. It, there's a lot of hope. I mean, when I think about the next generation and by the way, they're going to be my grandchild's pastors and doctors and lawyers. I have a lot of hope because when I see this generation who's raising up, um, I just see them as an inspiring, inspiring group of leaders. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm very that. optimistic in what I'm seeing. Yeah, me too. So let's get into your story a little bit. You have an amazing story. You're uh, an Ar- Iranian immigrant, 
Um, you know, tell us really quick just what what that looks like. Your dad being, you know, an important military member, and then kind of having a revolution going on in Iran in 1979 when you, you know most of us just have, um, you know, some. You know, I, I was born in 81, so this is just a little bit before my time. But they that was yeah. a big deal, and you went through a lot to get to America and establish a life for yourselves and your your family. Yeah, Travis. Um, like you said, I'm a, I'm an immigrant. Uh, when uh, my family uh, in 1979, uh, my family and I escaped from Iran when the Ayatollah Khomeini and his uh, zealots um, had a revolution and overthrew the government of Iran. My dad at that time was in the military, and um, we knew that our lives were in danger, and so we escaped from Iran, and eventually ended up here in America as refugees. Uh, we called it political asylum, Travis, but that was just a fancy way of saying because of the political situation in Iran and because of who my father was as a military leader, they had granted us political asylum. And so we came here. Um, I call it from religion gone wrong. And uh, we landed in America looking for um, a safe place to call home. And um, when I got here, I was uh, we moved to Texas. But not just Texas, Travis. We moved to um, Colleen, Texas, where the where Fort Hood, the largest army base in the world, is. And so, imagine during the Iranian hostage situation, where every day people are waking up and they're watching Iran burn an American flag, called America the Great Satan, and they'd held fifty four Americans hostage in the American embassy every day. And so, it was front page news every day. I mean, Dan Rather would start the news every day with. Day 62 of the hostage situation, day 64. It was all everybody was, it was like, how do we get our Americans back home? During the middle of all of that, we parachute in basically into Texas, small military town in America. And so talk about fish out of water, you know, um, and talk about just, I call it wedgie waiting to happen. You know, so um, I came here from the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, kind of a moment. And um and honestly, uh, for years and years, I was this outcasted kid who just really um, um, had a hard time fitting in. I was a bit, a bit of a loner. And, and then um, when I was 18 years old, uh, my father felt sorry for me for being an outcasted kid. And he helped me by giving me a new clothes and he kind of gave me a make makeover. And then my high school years became these years where I just did everything under the sun. Like it, like Solomon says, you know, to try to find um, purpose and hope. And I went from the loner kid to the kid who was kind of popular in high school and through big parties, you know, and ended up at the right lunchroom table. And I learned how to dump the right girl before she could dump me. <laughs> I learned how to be, I, I call it, I learned how to be cold, to be perceived as cool. But I was just this teenage kid who was just as insecure, just as broken. And I graduated from high school. And uh, pretty emotionally bankrupt. And um, a buddy of mine invited me to church. And I went to church. And this church saw me as um, um, a, an opportunity to, you know, to share the good news of Jesus. And, and so I eventually became a Christian. And, um, yeah, that's when I really found hope. And when I look back on the whole story arc of my life, I can see how... Um, the tra if it hadn't been for the tragedy of the revolution, if it hadn't been for all the hardship, it hadn't been for all those things, um, I wouldn't be where I am today. And, um, you know, I, my favorite Bible verse is Isaiah 41, 9 and 10, where um, the prophet Isaiah, you know, is, is talking about what God's saying. And, he, and God says, I took you from the ends of the earth and from its farthest corner. I called you and I said, you're my servant. Um, I will help you. I will uphold you in my righteous right hand. So do not fear. And I look at my life and literally, Travis, I see God holding me in his righteous right hand and taking us out of Iran and holding me through all the mistakes I made, you know, and continue to make. And but yet he um, he saved me. And so my story is uh, the, the ultimate hero. of My story is uh, obviously Jesus. But the, the practical hero of my story was a church. That uh, when I started visiting them, uh, a youth group, uh, that when I started visiting them, um, 
saw me as, as, as someone who was valuable to God. And they just started loving on me and ministering to me. It was Shades Mountain Baptist Church. Uh, that was the church that um, I always have such fond um, memories of and such a place in my heart of gratitude towards. Because, again, I, I say youth group, but they weren't a youth group. They were a youth ministry. And they just really stepped into my life. I love it. I love it. And the, you know, you've been through a lot. You, so was it nine years of like from moving to, from Iran before you really felt like comfortable in, in school and in America? Like it was that long of like that many years of feeling lonely and being like the outcast kid. Cause that's, that's brutal. Yeah, man, it it was brutal, bro. Like Travis, the, um, to be very honest, a lot of that was self-inflicted, you know? Um, I, I think it wasn't nine years where people are mean to me and I got bullied and all that. It was, there were certainly many moments like that, but people were also gracious to my family and kind to my family and not just, not just the church, but like people, you know, like welcomed us in into the neighborhood. And, uh, but a lot of it was me. I, I was just this insecure kid at, at nine years old. I come to America. It took me a while just to figure out the language, figure out the culture, figure out, you know. And yeah. then in my insecurity, I, I just, ch- it's chasing after the wind, you know, yeah. like it says in scripture, you know. And, totally and the Bible that. said, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world, but to forfeit his soul? And that was me. I was trying to gain the whole world. And I hadn't really figured out that I was made for something bigger than myself. Yeah. You know? And so, so much of what was broken about my life and so much of what was broken in society, in in my, in in, in every day is like my high school years, you know, um, it was all about the label that I wore, the places I ended up, the parties I threw, the thing, you know, but again, you don't have to be from Iran to know that. Bible says, uh, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, the presumption there is that there's been a transformation, you know? And so I hadn't had that, man. So because I had not been transformed by the renewing of my mind, because God did not live in me, all I wanted to do was conform to the patterns of the world. So that's, that's still a battle. I'm that's sure. where, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. No, but yeah, I haven't arrived. The only yeah. difference now is uh, Christ in me, the hope of glory, you yeah. know? It's a beautiful As thing. The apostle said. So when did, when did you know that you were going to be called? You know, you 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 were saved. You went through this kind of process with your family too, which is really unique. Where your family kicked you out because they were Muslim yeah. and they weren't weren't thrilled with you, um, you know, turning your life over to Jesus. But when when did you feel called to ministry and doing? Because you've been doing this for decades. This is not this is not new. You've been kind of this faith leader over a long period yeah. of time. Yeah, I'm old. Travis. <laughs> you're not that you're not that old, <laughs> believe me. I think the older you get, the more you're like, okay, forties isn't old, you know, fifties isn't isn't as old as it used to be. <laughs> I'm in my fifties. Uh man, I, the night I became a Christian, I just remember thinking this. This sounds weird, but I, I didn't have this uh, moment of calling like some people have. God God is so unique in the way he calls people in a very different way, you know. And everyone has a calling on their life. But as far as a calling to a ministry profession, for me, Travis, the night I became a Christian, I just remember thinking, um, this is too good to keep to myself. I felt like I'd found the cure for everything that was broken in my life. And I knew all my buddies, not my Iranian buddies, (laughs) my American buddies, my high school buddies, the ex-girlfriends. I knew all these people that that were longing for the same kind of fulfillment that I was longing and going to all the wrong places looking for it. And, uh, and so I just remember thinking, this is too good to keep to myself. And, and so I just went out and started telling my friends about the Lord. So nobody was handing me a microphone to go speak. You know, I just felt like um, there was a burden in my, um, uh, you know, in me to go share, to talk about what God had done. Later on, I realized that I, I had better language for it. But, you know, uh, scripture says, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, which means share the gospel and use your use your own personal testimony to testify to the power of it. And Travis, like I didn't know the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. I just knew that God had done something great in my life. And I would just go to Burger King 
and talk to people about Jesus. <laughs> I'd have a revival in Kentucky, fried chicken. You know what I mean? I would just literally go to the Kentucky fried chicken and stand in line and buy somebody's meal and go, I'll buy you your meal. But if, if while we're sitting there and you're eating, I get to tell you about what God's done in my life. You know, and that's how I got going in, I would say, proclaiming the gospel. And then God brought some spiritual dads into my life. There was a guy named Jay Strack, and there was another guy named Rick Stanley, and then eventually Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham organization. And so God brought some spiritual fathers into my life um, that kind of took me under their wing and gave me platform. And what I mean by that is it was a platform I didn't have on my own, but they allowed me to be able to boast on what God was doing in my life, you know, um, off of their earned platform. Yeah. And uh, so my story is uh, a ministry calling is just being in the shadow of great father figures in my life who, and, and men um, and women in ministry who just opened doors for me. And, and by the way, in the meanwhile, God also brought um, people that just um, poured beyond their platform. They, they poured theology into my life. Um You know, I was a Christian for a few years, for example, Travis, and um, I moved to Houston and to be an intern at a church. And Dale and Vicki Bynum graciously opened up their home. They were church members at the church that I went to be an intern at and a youth intern. And they opened up their uh, home to me. And I lived, you know, in one of the bedrooms in their home. And Dale Bynum had turned his uh, living room into a library and that man would come and hear me speak to the youth and would then mark in theology books in his you know room like places where i'd gotten it wrong he wouldn't say these are places where you got it wrong he would just go it was interesting you said that where'd you get that from you know and he would mark spurgeon and calvin and bl dag and you know commentaries and he just graciously and patiently invested into my life that year that I lived there. And honestly, like I look back and goodness, people like that just stepped into my life and helped me, you know, um, and shaped me. And, and um, so, yeah, I think I've done mostly just messing up. <laughs> other other people have just kind of, I've leaned on their shoulders, you know? Yeah. Um, that's, that's such a and great story. I think it, it, it kind of speaks to the how building the faith led into the leadership roles because you were you know walking in faith in big ways as a as a new believer not you know not coming from that background. What a sweet story it is to move into those leadership roles with those folks who saw that potential in you and where you've been now. You've invested for like I said decades into others. It's yeah, a beautiful thing, and it's leadership. I, I really believe leadership is influence, and you've had incredible influence over a lot of people, no matter whose coattails you rode, that leadership and that influence is, is, um, you know, walking in faith created a huge impact, has created a huge impact, will continue to create a huge impact going forward. It's a sweet part yeah. of your story. You touched on something there, you know, just again, influence. Like Travis, if you look back at your life, you know, you've been so blessed and successful, you know, I mean, goodness, from what what God has opened for you so rare in politics and as a communicator and you know you're just a, a visionary leader and you you're just an unusual man you know but if you look at it l- think about the people that believed in you early on that opened doors for you that had patience with you let had a you were they were a safe place for you to make mistakes they didn't give up on you they should have fired you they didn't fire you you know what <laughs> I mean yeah. uh, and my life is filled with those kind of moments I, I'd love to ask you like Anybody come to mind like that just really believed in you early on or really helped open the door yeah, well, for you? I mean, my mom above anything, you know, I, we, we moved a lot when I was a kid mm-hmm. and we moved in the middle of, and going into seventh grade year from Orlando, which was a melting pot of people to Dublin, Ohio, which was a very homogenous community. Yeah. And, um, and it was a very clicky community and I was, I was bullied mercilessly mm-hmm. go, between my seventh, seventh to eighth grade years high school when I finally started kind of growing into my body and and getting better at sports. I kind of, I kind of grew into my own in high school and became, you know, I could rely on sports as a thing that kept people from messing with me. But in middle school, man, I was, I was bullied mercilessly. So my mom was kind of the, 
the person that we always talked about Jesus and like, this is not our home and that, you know, this is, these are important, but mm. these ideas of faith are important to lean on when we're struggling really hard and we have adversity. But it wasn't until in college when I had men in uh, campus outreach that were investing in me that I grew a ton of my faith mm. and started owning those convictions myself when I started seeing the importance of my own growth and being bold and courageous, speaking, you know, talking to others about Jesus and, and, um, I mean, really right. using that as an influential model for, you know, using the person and, and what I've grown in the last 10 years is using the person of Jesus, not just the faith leader, but the person of Jesus in a leadership role, what I'm doing in politics as an example for how you influence going forward. Like this, this man was a service servant mm. leader. He wasn't just a spiritual leader. This is a man that walked the earth that influenced more people than anybody has ever walked the earth. And why is that? So like learning the principles of the leadership. Right of Jesus is important as a faith in faith, because I think they're everyday principles that we can use to move the needle in relationships, to love others. And, um, especially in politics today, politics is such a crazy, crazy thing, but I just had a lot of, I had a lot of people, yeah. my mom, I had several mentors in, in, um, college. I've always searched for mentors after leaving college. So when I moved to Missouri, um, I worked with my dad, which is, you know, I want to get to once at some point, cause I know you work with your son. Um, but the, you know, I had that yeah. and then I have another mentor that spends time with me and the, these brothers I walk with, but I think mentorship and having people there with you kind of, um, telling you where you're going right and where you go wrong is super helpful. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. That's so good. Yeah. So let's let really quick. Um, you're an author. You, you got to tell me this story about how you became like a music producer <laughs> Cause I looked at this and like <laughs> Mac, Mac Powell and third day, you know, I, I, their music has, has, you know, when I got to go play in this, this, uh, this golf tournament with you all here, uh, in May, mm. which was an awesome experience. I, I played golf with, um, with the lead singer of mercy me, which is in college, like their yeah. music chain, you know, was, was super incredible. I got to hang out around Chris Tomlin who also, you know, relied on his music for growth in my faith and, it's just an amazing experience, but you, you know, I'm, I'm looking into all your story and you have so many, all these little, like these little, these little connecting points in your story that are really amazing. Mm. How do you get yeah. into music? You know, you wrote a book and then you said you went to Mac Powell and you're like, Hey, why don't you write a, why don't we write a, do a CD to go along with this book, which I've never heard of anybody doing that before, but like, what's the process yeah. for that? And, um, how fun is that got to be yeah, that's around those folks? Yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, I uh, Mac was just getting going in third day, and I was just getting going in um, in ministry. And um, when I say that, like third day was um, doing youth rallies, and I was doing youth rallies, and we we met and we hit it off. Uh, funny funny story is uh, I walked into a auditorium where they were doing sound check and I was supposed to be the speaker that night at this rally and they were warming up to a song by by a group called driving and crying and <laughs> the song is called honeysuckle blues and it's one of my favorite bands from Athens Georgia and so they were just riffing off the song honeysuckle blues and I was like how do they know that that's my favorite song and it's not a well-known band so we end up backstage together and we start talking about Georgia, you know, and honey, and Athens, Georgia, and the music scene there. And I was like, oh, are you guys Georgia fans? And uh, Max started laughing. He was like, no, sir, I'm a Bama fan. <laughs> and I'm a Bama fan. And so it's so funny. It was uh, our connection was off of a college music band and our love for Bama football. And then, and then crazy enough, buddy, the next week we were together again at a rally. And it was the night Princess Diana died. Oh, no. And our wives were at the event, and somehow Mac's wife Amy ended up in my hotel room with Mac and my wife Jennifer and I, and we stayed up all night with the TV on watching that. But we just hung out, and we just became friends. And so we became friends um, and kind of cut our teeth in ministry together, you know, and had a lot of commonalities. Our kids, all of a sudden, we call them the Nowels like the Nassers and the Powells, <laughs> our kids kind of started growing up together and fast forward a few years later and we were on vacation and we were flipping burgers and Max said, what are you working on now? And I said, I'm writing this book 
um, where I'm trying to portray this idea that God is not silent about every circumstance of our life. But the primary way that God reveals himself is his word. And I was telling him about that. And I said, I want to pick like 20 different places where God is speaking out of scripture. You know, if you're going through hardship, here's what God has to say. If you're going through a promotion, here's what God has to say. You know. And as I started telling him about that, I talked about some of these passages of scripture. And Mac, like literally we're flipping burgers together. And we're talking about like what's next, you know, what I'm working on next. And Mac said, some of those verses um, are awesome because, I, you know, because they, they would make great songs. And we started talking about that. And then he offered, he said, hey, if you want, we can do an accompaniment, like an, an accompanying CD that has all the verses from the book that you can slide into the book. And I thought he's just being sweet to me because he's so much more famous than I am. And I, and I was like, no. But then like the next day he goes, hey, if you really want to do that, I've got all next week left open. So why don't we text all of our friends and ask if they want to come do this thing? And my wife loves bluegrass music, my wife, Jennifer. So I said, hey, can it be bluegrass? I was kind of kidding. And he was like, sure. So, man, we did a bluegrass scripture music CD. We did it in four days, you know like really, really quick the next week and slid it in a book called Glory Revealed. And the album was called Glory Revealed. But somehow that little record, um, God had his hand on. Because yeah. I think it's just God's word. You memorize the songs and you're mem you, you memorize the 10 songs and you're memorizing over 50 passages of scripture verbatim, you know? Yeah. So, um, and um, man, the next thing you know, uh, Provident took it and it won a couple of Dove Awards. and. So I'm literally a living example of what happens when you just have friends in high places. I know nothing about <laughs> That's music. Not true. That's <laughs> not completely <laughs> true. Like there's, there's some, <laughs> some effort you have to give. So I, you know, I think you're being I very mean, humble. I was the executive producer as in, I pointed to Bible verses and said, this is a good one guys. Yeah. So listen, I think you David, need to take more credit. If I'm you, I'm like, heck yeah. I wrote a, I wrote an album. I won awards. Like I'd be wearing that. I'd have a tattoo. I didn't even, I mean, bro, it's, they're literally scripture. I think when I get to heaven, <laughs> David is going to come up to me and go, those are my songs. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting royalty yeah. checks off of Psalm 51. So I fun. wrote that. You know? Well, certainly there's a, but there's honestly, a lot just of help. Beyond help. Even, even beyond Chris, I'm sorry. I was going to no. tell you, like, even be, even so much beyond Mac, like my friendship with Chris, you know, um, uh, and what we're doing together at For Others uh, and, and so many of these other artists now lending their voice, like Bart, who was your you know, golf partner. Um, these guys, we all just got going in ministry together and watched each other's kids grow up and ended up in green rooms and events together. And now to be able to um, see God open up all these doors that I don't have the ability to open. You know, Chris Tomlin has so many more doors that are open to him than, than for me. And so, so often um, he will leverage his good reputation. He will leverage his voice. He will leverage his audience to help us be able to do the things that we're doing. And so yeah. again, I think so much of my life is uh, being at the right time at the right place and just keeping your head down and letting, letting God open doors that I couldn't have the ability to open on my own. Yeah. Since you brought up Chris, let's move into the business side of things where you, you know, you left Liberty yeah. university as a VP and higher up and getting to do all this really amazing stuff bringing guests in front of your kids and your um, convocations, thousands of students. Um, and you were hired by four others to be the president, which is an organization that's fighting for vulnerable kids, which speaks to our heart. My wife is a licensed professional counselor. Like I mentioned to you earlier, she works with kids. Um, she's coming into council today. We're in the counseling house. I built a studio in a house that we built, mm. uh, not that we built, that we bought. And um, I put my studio in here. So we're working kind of together in this house that we really are praying over as a healing house. But she does all our counseling wow. here on Tuesdays. And um, but anyway, we so we, we go to this event. We, we meet um, Chris and Lauren Tomlin, who also have this heart. And we weren't even supposed to be at this event. It just worked out. But we meet yeah. Chris and Lauren Tomlin, who have this heart for kids that we are in the same space, you know, fighting. Uh, my wife is, and particularly feels called in this space and is incredibly talented with in this space. Um, but I'm a state legislator who, you know, can um, impact policy too around this. And you guys are doing this stuff that I think in my campaign, which is a very competitive campaign last year, 
to to become a state senator, one of my tenants, one of my three mm. tenants was fight for kids, protect kids. Because we're in a society that we're I don't I don't think we're valuing kids like we should. And that's like I don't know, it breaks my heart. I know it breaks yours. You wouldn't be doing what you're doing if you weren't, but that's a lot in there. Why let, maybe you just start with this question. How did how did you meet Chris Tomlin? How'd you guys get this connection? <laughs> how did you get that job? And then we'll go from yeah. there beyond all the stuff I just the broad stuff I just mentioned. We tell this story all the time because people always ask us, like, now that we locked arms and helping children together with four others, how did you meet? Thumbs up a lot. And uh, we, we met uh, almost 25 years ago in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, the night that we met, um, we were carjacked together, like at gunpoint, carjacked. Like they took my rental car. And so it was traumatic the, way, the night that we met. But we just kind of bonded that night. You know, and um, at that time, you know, we were just two young guys again, like getting going in ministry and uh, and literally at gunpoint, this guy takes our my rental car. And um, and we just have this crazy story on how our friendship began. And then throughout the years, it, it, it's just been nothing short of breathtaking to see how God has raised Chris's stock, you know, to be really the modern day psalmist for our generation. Um, yeah. Time magazine says more people sing a Chris Tomlin song around the world than anyone else in the, in the world, 30 to 40 million people a, a week in churches sing songs that God has given Chris for That's the crazy. church. And, and I, what I've loved about him is watching the way that he and Lauren have leveraged every bit of that to do common good, you know? And so Chris has just not let it get to his head. And uh, Lauren has just really bought into this idea. Chris and Lauren have bought into this idea that God has given them a big arrow to point to something that's so much bigger than them and their gain. And so um, for years and years as friends, we've partnered together here and there. Like when I church planted in Birmingham, uh, in the inner city of Birmingham, 10 years ago, Travis, uh, Chris and Lauren, on his birthday weekend, okay, this, is, this, is, this tells you everything you need to know about Chris and Lauren Tomlin. On his birthday weekend, he bought our church because we had an inner city church. He bought us a bus, a 55 passenger bus. On his birthday, he bought me a bus. We <laughs> called it How Great Is Our Bus. And then we, uh, and we drove around the inner city and we picked up, we picked up kids, you know, and brought them to church. And it was amazing. Picked up families and it was amazing. And so throughout the years, we, we partnered together here and there. And, um, our time at Liberty was coming to an end. We knew that God was, kind of opening a new chapter in our lives. And he said, hey, David, uh, would you pray about coming and being a part of this with us? And um, and we, I'm not, um, I'm not well-versed in nonprofit world. I'm not a, you know, uh, that's not where I've got, I'm, I'm a preacher and a culture builder, you know? And, um, and so uh, they patiently allowed me to be a part of something for a few years. And, and I'm telling you, like, we knew going in that this wasn't necessarily some long-term thing, but it was like, let's all kind of come together, put our hands in the same, you know, on, on this, this opportunity and push in the same direction. And um, it's been amazing to see what God's done in the last few years with four others. I mean, our goal ultimately is to help vulnerable children in America find safe and secure homes. And so, you know, how do we help children who are, are at risk of being displaced from their home stay in their home if we can? So that's the prevent piece. There's three P's in our world. How sure. do we prevent kids from losing their family? And then how do we provide for those who have lost their home, who've lost their family? So they're in the foster care system and or they're waiting to be adopted. And so um, how do we help, you know, provide? And so there's the prevention piece. There's the provide piece. And then those who are in the system and never find permanency as a place to belong, but they're aging out of the system. That's the third P. How do we prepare these children? And maybe it's too late for them to be adopted, but it's not too late for them to belong. You know, and the key there is mentorship. And so how do we find them a good mentor? And so those are the three P's. Those are our pillars. And we wake up every day and think about them. And the event that you were at with us was a golf tournament, celebrity golf tournament, and then a, a night event. and it was about raising awareness and funding, and um, we we take the we take the funding and the awareness, and again, it's all hands on deck. The power of the collective, 
and we're pushing and we're pushing. But honestly, Travis, the heroes in the trenches are people like your wife. You know, you're the ones face to face every day in that counseling cabin or whatever you guys call it, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, doing the good work. And so our question is like, how do we help churches become foster friendly? How do we help good counselors like your wife get more help? How do we find, how do we help foster kids not get um, children in the foster care system, not get bounced around seven times? That's the national average. That find one safe place to belong and they stay, which means better counseling, better support, better wraparound, you know, um, help. And so those are the things that we try to do. It's, we, we try to have a holistic strategy on how we serve. And we lean heavily on the platform of a lot of our folks, including our founders, Chris and Lauren. And then, uh, for example, we'll start here in, in the next month or two being out on tour with Need to Breathe, uh, you know, and we just uh, saw them every concert. night. The other you know, day, they're, yeah. they're terrific. Every night, Bear is going to stop the show and, you know, wave a flag for vulnerable kids. You know, that's incredible that Bear has a heart for this. And this is personal for him. Uh, you know, Bear's wife, um, this is her great passion too. Like they have a great family, but they care about kids who don't have one. We don't have a family. And so our partnership is about like, there's people come to see them. And so how do they take a few minutes to, to do what they're doing? You know, uh, you know, and then a lot of it even goes, they're just unsung, uh, goes without ever anybody noticing, uh, like, um, need to breathe puts what they call a ticket tax on every concert. And so when people come to one of their shows, you know, whenever you buy a ticket to go see Ed Sheeran or Taylor Swift or whatever, there's all these little hidden fees. Well, this isn't a hidden fee. It's a $1 ticket tax that they put on their shows. And what's amazing is no one's people go, what is that? And they go, that's money that we set aside from, for every single person who comes to our shows to help do good. And they have helped in the tune of millions of dollars with our good friends, One World Health, uh, build hospitals around the world for vulnerable children around the world. And in the more domestic in our own backyard, we're their great partner and uh, we're helping kids in the foster care system. And so I don't have that audience. You know what I mean? Nobody comes to see me, buddy. Like <laughs> need to breathe 6,000 people a night. You know what I mean? Like they have an audience, trusted audience. And so for Bear to take five minutes of a, of a concert and just swing for kids, you know what I mean? Like wave a flag for kids, you know, swing for the fences for them. It, it's so valuable. And we're so grateful for those kind of partners. That's amazing. And I, I've got to ask you, not not a question necessarily for that, but just for my own selfish interest. But yeah, two, two things. One, um, how do we get you guys to come to Missouri? Like, and do a concert, you know, get Chris and get, get need yeah. to breathe and we'll do something. Brent B shore. Who's a great friend. He can help figure yeah. out like, where do we do this? How do we make this a, a big thing, but we can get friends and family and, and create kind of a big, a big thing about it. My it's very, it's very precious to us. My wife and I yeah. are calling my father-in-law. Who's an incredible man. He's his son. My brother-in-law is also a counselor and he works with families mm. And then my father-in-law is very, very passionate about this call to, to, um, for counseling. And he's, he's got his own foundation to raise money for folks to get the counseling they need because there's such a huge need in the mental health space. But like yeah. this foster care system in Absolutely. Missouri in particular is like a real problem. We, we, not only do we need policy change, which is where I feel called yeah. in my own space is like, wh what policies do we change on a state level? Because Missouri is one of the highest level, highest per capita states of foster care children, which is a, f a major yeah. fail and it shouldn't be that way. And secondly, so how do it's, we... it's interesting. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that, I mean, that, that's, that's me shooting my shot. Like <laughs> come to Missouri. Yeah. Let's, how do we partner? How do we make this, how do we make this happen in Missouri? And, and, um, do yeah, better. absolutely. Well, sh short answer is uh, done. Let's figure it out. Like, we'll, let's figure out what artists and those kind of things. Like, you and I have a, a new friendship here, and uh, I'd love for us to figure out places that we can minister. But let, let me just tell you, um, we were in Missouri last week at Mizzou, you know, with, oh, with Coach Drink. And um, that guy's a stud. I, I got to tell you, Big like that Trent. guy is what a stud of a coach and his entire team there. Uh, coach Drink loves 
um, children, loves ser serving vulnerable children in his own backyard and feels like everything that he has as a coach has to be leveraged about not just winning football games, but creating winners for life. And so last week we partnered with our good friends, Coyote Hill and our friends uh, at, at Mizzou, and they brought children um, all from, from that state to, to um, the football facilities at Mizzou. And um, we connected a football player with a child in the foster care system. And they basically paired up all day and they did drills and had fun. And it was called a day of champions, you know, and then they ate dinner and we gave out prizes and we encouraged all these foster parents. And I'm just telling you, like last week we were doing Mizzou for others. Oh man. Um, with I wish I was team. there with you all. That's amazing. And, um, and, and the hero in the trenches wasn't for others. The hero in the trenches wasn't even like famous football players in a football stadium that, you know, seats 60,000 people or even coach drink who during sec media days decided this is valuable. We're doing it. I mean, that's crazy, right? The hero was coyote Hill. This incredible organization in your city yeah. that has built these amazing homes for foster parents to be able to exist and do what they do with excellence, you know? And so we support organizations like Coyote Hill. We call them our still water grants. And, um, uh, you know, Coyote Hill has these eight bedroom homes, you know, five bath, eight bedroom homes where five foster children can exist in, a, you know, in excellence in these beautiful homes and get a lot of care and get a lot of um, things that are not afforded to children, you know, a lot of times. And they have found a model, by the way, that's really inspiring. And we want to help replicate all around the country. We're, we're really inspired by it. But I, I say that to say uh, we're learning a lot from your state on uh, uh, you have a lot of solutions there on how to do what we're doing. And I'm taking that Mizzou story, you know, Mizzou football partnership, Mizzou for others. And I'm taking it to other teams saying, hey, uh, Coach Hugh Freeze is doing it at Auburn. Coach, you know, Drink is doing it at Mizzou. Why can't we do Bama for others? Why can't we do Florida State for others? You know, why can't we? Because these kids look to you as heroes. Give us four hours in an afternoon and let's bring children in for like a half day camp and let's have a blast. And let's yeah. give these kids a day of hope and inspiration. And man, it's it. it Yes, yeah, so I say that to say, well done, Missouri. <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, it's so you're so already great. doing Co it. But Coyote uh, Hills awesome. Yeah. My wife has talked to them several times, and they've kind of interviewed her for partnerships, and because they know she does trauma informed care, which is kind of their wheelhouse stuff. So yeah, I love that you're working with with Coyote Hill. They're terrific. Yeah, man. Uh, so so how long has she been doing? Uh, trauma and force care. And so she, she's, uh, um, is actually going to go to a TBRI training hopefully this year. Um, trauma based. So I, I can't even tell you what TBRI means. I know it's trauma based care. Um, and I think Coyote Hill is helping her get in because it's a very selective training. They don't let that many people in and right. you kind of almost have to have a network that can help you get into that, which is crazy to me because there's so much need for trauma informed care. But Amy's really into the neurological yeah. side of care. Um, and so right. they, they've just, they've just kicked around ideas on how to, you know, how, how could they serve each other right now? My wife just does individual, individual care with foster care. We've, we've connected with mm. the mid Missouri foster care and adoption association. And they, you know, they send clients to her because she's really the only child based, um, one of the, one of the very few counselors in Jefferson city. Um, that take care of kids. Mm -hmm. And so there's just a huge, there's a massive yeah. need. That's amazing. That's really great to hear. We, we have one of our pillar partners that we support and try to onboard as fast as we can to as many places as we can is telecounseling, uh, trauma, you know, um, focused. And um, it's called chosen because, you know, as much as we need people in a room doing the counseling, and the incredible work like your wife is doing this heroic. We also just have families who just need a at nine at nine o'clock at night, need a phone number to call and just get on the phone with someone like your wife and just be mm -hmm. talked off the ledge, you know, or be yeah, given she... some reinforcement, encouragement. And so that's yeah. what chosen does. Also, you know, Missouri 
is home to probably one of our strongest partners, which is Care Portal. That's uh, really making an impact around the country, Kansas City, you know, and so uh, is their home. And uh, we love Care Portal and what Joe and those leadership there are doing. I got to get connected with them. I've never heard of them, but I'd love to love to be a connection. And and the state policy needs a change. I've I've met with the director of our state department on this, and he he himself has told me, and I don't know how how much I'm supposed to repeat this, but he's like, if we could create, if we could have fashioned a system system that's worse than the one we have in Missouri, then I would be surprised. Mm. And that that is that's terrifying because that's just hurting kids. I mean, on a daily basis, my office yeah. is receiving calls from foster care parents and adoptive parents that are just getting hammered by the system. And that is so unfortunate. Right. And that's where we, we need to be collaborative. Like we, we've we got it. like we're, what's happening right now in Arkansas is so inspiring. What's happening right now in Tennessee is so inspiring. What's happening, it, it just finally, just practical solutions or finally better governance or finally co- collaborative efforts, finally, for the sake of the kids, the faith-based organizations and the government-based organizations coming together, you know, like, hey, let's all set our ground rules so that no one's overstepping, but let's just for the sake of these kids, like get together and let's work. And when I see what's happening right now in, uh, in certain states, it's really encouraging. And Travis, a leader like yourself, um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can come and see what's happening. Like for example, right now, um, with some of these programs in some of these states and some of the new um, just inventive solutions that are being offered and uh, really apply them. Uh, honestly, care, care portal is on fire in Florida. Care portal is on fire in Oklahoma. Um, it's such a practical, well-designed product for lack of better terms. I mean, care portal is a social worker, finds a need. So let's say it's, you know, the social worker walks in a house and sees that there's bed bugs all over the beds for these kids, right? And the social worker is going, we've got to find a remedy or I have to remove the kids from the home because it's not safe for them. So the social worker posts the need on the platform. Like I need mattresses or I need whatever. There's the need. Um, Then all of a sudden the community champion sees the need and comes out and meets the need. But with that, does wrap around support. It, it's brilliant. That it's is just brilliant. brilliant. And um, it, it's a way it, it, uh, with our three P's, you know, there's the prevent, provide, you know, um, and prepare. It's our best solution for prevention. You know, a, a, a lady's transmission falls out of her car. Oh, and she, and she can't make it to work. And all of a sudden she's missing a week worth of work. She's about to lose her job, which means she's going to lose her kids. Yeah. And she literally posts Man. the need in care portal. And then I was in the room at Mizzou with coach drink. When I saw the quarterbacks of the team get up and go, we, we just read about a lady who needs some help with her car. And we've decided we're going to meet that need. <laughs> and boom. They met that need and they helped her keep her, get her car fixed so that she didn't have to, she could keep that's going awesome. to work and not lose her kids. That's care portal. Some, that's, I mean, that's innovative great. solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, By listen, way, I, I can get, I'll get a walking whole, distance for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I'll it's, connect you. I'll connect you. <laughs> it would take me a couple of days, but it, you know, we can drive over there in a couple hours, but they, you know, <laughs> right. I, I can get a group of policymakers together. Um, just the nature yeah. of being where I'm at and, and, tour a place like that. I'm actually supposed to be in Kansas city on August 4th, um, mm. for some meetings. So, you know, I, there's all kinds of ways to, to spin the cat. I just, I just need to know what I can do, like what's been effective elsewhere. Cause I don't need to reinvent the wheel. Like you mentioned. Absolutely. Um, and I, you know, we've, we've, we're coming up on, on an hour here, David. I know that was, that's about the time you had. I appreciate your time. I have, I have one more, um, thought for you and this is just for, for others. I love your yeah. organization. You guys are amazing incredibly encouraged by what you're doing and you can find them for others.com is it for others.com is the website for you all it is yeah um what you're doing there to to fight for vulnerable kids is amazing and and you know starting this media company part of what i'm doing is just kind of giving people advice on media but you guys have an incredible story you got to you get you know you guys do a great job your media team did a great job on on highlighting the event that happened 
you guys need to keep telling that story. It's, it's incredible. And there's so many ways to do that. You know, whether it's you having a podcast or a weekly video or, you know, I'm sure you're busy. I'm not trying to give you any, <laughs> any advice because you know, you guys know what you're doing, but you know, just love to love to see content from you guys because what you're doing is so incredibly mm. important. Um, and those videos you just released were, were awesome. Well done. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. We, I agree. I mean, we're a young organization and sure, have to continue yeah. to develop and get better and better at, uh, at telling our story and, and honestly telling the story of these amazing heroes who are stepping into the life of, of these children and, and doing the good. Nothing, nothing inspires someone to adopt more than an adoption story. Nothing yeah. inspires someone to step into the life uh, of, of a child and rescue and more than someone who's already, who's done that, you know, in the past. And so um, yeah. you're right. We got to get better at that. And we're going to keep growing. Um, we have a board member uh, who owns a video company, you know, and uh, he's the primary owner of uh, an incredible vi uh, storytelling video company. And, and um, uh, they, and so that's what we're just blessed in that uh, Chad on our board uh, who's this incredible charismatic leader um, and uh, has, has just, we have the, their, we have them at our disposal to be yeah. able to utilize. And uh, it's just, again, a testimony of what happens when a bunch of people bring their resources together and we do together what we couldn't do alone. And so people go, man, your social media looks so good. You have a we have very talented people, but it's just, it helps to have a board member who owns a great video company. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, being in Nashville too, to like like you're, you like, have, you have so, so access to so many, so much talent in Nashville too. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, Absolutely. that's and it, amazing. It doesn't, the, it doesn't hurt to have a, yeah, go ahead. Well, sorry. The last question I'm going to ask, and then I'm going to let you go. What's it like working with your son? I've worked with my dad. The, the job I just quit to do my media company. I worked with my dad for 16 years. And, um, yeah. you know, it means, it means a lot. What's it like working with your son? I love it. <laughs> Is he in the room? Tell him I'm so proud that he's working with his dad. Yeah, that's right. Well, I love it. David, thanks, man, for the time. This is such a blessing to me. I, listen, I'd love it. That'd be that'd be amazing. Um, we need all the help we can get, and I'm I'm willing to put my Senate Senate career on this this policy change it just needs to happen like if if I leave and what I've accomplished is helping fight for kids then I've done what I've I need to do so appreciate your work all right brother we'll be in touch thanks man see ya